and welcome to Newsroom's latest episode of Raw Politics. This is a weekly visual and audio political chat with myself, Newsroom's political editor, Joe Moyer, Newsroom's co-editor, Tim Murphy. Hi, Tim. Hi, Joe. Hi, Sam. And Newsroom's national affairs editor, Sam Suchdeva, who has left me to join Tim in Auckland today. Hello, Sam. Howdy, Joe. I'm just fleeing for uh, warmer weather, although it's very humid, so I don't know if I'm a fan. I'll be retreating as soon as possible. (laughs) <laughs> Good, we look forward to having you back. Uh, this week we're going to be dissecting the budget and the politics around that and we'll be taking a look at whether Labour might have a former All Black in the wings. To wrap things up, as usual we'll offer a recommendation for something that we've enjoyed this week that we think that you might like too. Now, of course, it has been the budget this week, so we better talk about the budget, I guess, but not too much because I feel like we've already had a lot of that over the last uh, 24 hours or so. But let's start at least with the sort of big picture stuff, uh, the big, well, the big ticket stuff really, uh, the cost of living package that was announced. Two things in that that really stuck out were, of course, the uh, early childhood education, 20 hours free being extended to two-year-olds, and of course that more universal policy, which was the scrapping of the $5 co-payments for prescriptions. Um, interesting sort of announcements there. One is delayed in the sense that the early childhood education won't come in for two-year-olds until March next year, almost a year away. Uh, the uh, prescriptions, of course, will come in in July this year. So, Tim, let's start with you. What did you make of uh, the cost of living package? We always knew it was going to be a big cost of living budget. Has has the government delivered? I think it's juggled all its very difficult prickly balls that it's got to deal with uh, and managed to give one colourful, um, attractive element, which is the uh, childcare and the prescriptions. They're delayed, but they couldn't do a lot else. They couldn't put any more balls in the air because of debt, because of deficit, because of government spending as a percentage of GDP. All of these things are too high and they want them to track down, and in this budget they managed to spend a little bit on these new elements of the prescription cut and the early childhood education while still tracking down on the percentage of the spending of GDP the government's doing on the deficit and on debt. So they're kind of trying to do everything at once. Usually you fall between two stools when you try and be that timid. Sam, just on the prescriptions, um, you unfortunately had told me that you thought they might do something in this space but hadn't actually put it out to the world. Um, so I'm going to let you have that one and say that Thank you, you did call it, kind of. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that? I mean, it's obviously universal, so it's something for everyone. Um, do you think that they've, they've got that one right? Yeah, look, I think it's of a piece with how Labor has approached some a lot of these initiatives in the past. Jacinda Ardern and Chris Hipkins have both been questioned at points, you know, why aren't you taking a more targeted approach to rolling out these measures? Why not aim it at the, the poorest New Zealanders? But they are of the view that, you know, that it's best to reduce the barriers that are in place. Yes, you might give it to some people who don't need it, but it's better than leaving it out for others who may not. So um, I think there's clear evidence that uh, these co-payments are a barrier for, for some New Zealanders. I know some people have said, look, Chemist Warehouse, I think Countdown, yeah. others don't charge you that um, co-payment. But that's not available everywhere and there may not be people who are aware of it. So it's it's not a huge amount of money, uh, but it will amount, amount up for some people, I guess. You know, you, if you've got more than one prescription, if you've got, say, several to half a dozen, that could be 20 to $30 a month you, month you save. And so there's the financial impact but then there's also the benefit to the health system if you don't have these people who are being admitted into primary care or secondary care with more serious conditions because they just haven't been able to get their hands on the meds they need. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly heard from um, several ministers yesterday when they were whipping their way through the Beehive uh, Theatrette for their various stand-ups talking about the fact that, you know, in their own electorates they had plenty of constituents um, who weren't collecting uh, those uh, scripts. You had, um, you know, the likes of Megan Woods uh, in Christchurch uh, electorate saying that, you know, she had local pharmacies where you'd walk in and there'd just be shelves and shelves and shelves of um, prescriptions that hadn't been picked up purely because of the, the cost. So, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be 
been made that um, you know what they're saying is happening uh, is happening. I thought one other thing in the cost of living package um, that was particularly interesting was this uh, KiwiSaver parental payment. So this is for um, obviously parents who are taking paid parental leave. Who um, I mean, predominantly really, it's centred around women who have lower KiwiSaver savings um, and have less saved for their retirement once they get to that point um, as a result of the fact that they have taken time off to, to have children. So this is a situation where the government's now saying that um, if uh, you know women or men, whoever it is that's at home with the child, decides to put um, contributions in still, then uh, the government will be the employer contribution and will match that. Um, I think I think it's a great policy. I mean, I asked David Parker um, after the budget why they hadn't done this sooner. I mean, the inequities that have existed there, um, you know, particularly for women, have been very stark for a long time. But interesting to see this sort of um, gender sort of budget stuff starting to happen. Tim, um, you know, is it is it taken too long to get here, or you know, is this a, I guess is this a big political move to finally start saying that this is the sort of stuff that they're going to be focusing on? Well, it has taken too long, and like you, I would have just presumed this had been done. Uh, it's a bit like the um, trust e tax, which we'll talk about later, where you know why did it take so long to look at something so obvious. But in terms of the the uh, political play of it, the, the, I read had a good read through the well-being budget documents, and this is in there under the gender um, budgeting element that they've kind of drawn out this year. And it's one interesting thing. You could look at the wellbeing budget and say, well, it's a whole lot of kind of soft, um, almost branding. But what it has done, the process of the wellbeing budget has probably made ministries and officials and politicians assess and look at some of these elements uh, out of the, the whole. And so you can look at the gender uh, elements and see, well, look, here's a raging gap. On this one and there'll be others and there's lots of others that they will be able to look at but it's just the the uh, way that it kind of forces the issue to the the top which I thought was interesting. Mm. Hey I want to talk about tax as well um, I feel like we talk about tax all of the time and usually it's talking about the fact that nothing is happening with tax something did happen in the budget with tax you've um, alluded to that already Tim um, with the the trustee tax what is interesting about that I think is that it's not kicking in until next year and you've had weeks if not months of um, Chris Hipkins and Grant Robertson saying that Labor is going to have its tax policy sorted for the election manifesto ahead of October and that there's not going to be any changes now David Parker was arguing till he was blue in the face yesterday that this was not a tax change because they'd always said that they were going to monitor to see whether there would be a loophole in this area where you know people started putting more money into trusts as a result of that slightly lower um, t- uh, tax rate that it had. Uh, obviously, it wasn't in the top 39% and, and now it's going to be. Um, Sam, what do you make of, I guess, the, um, the interesting argument from David Parker that this is not a tax change? I think he referred to it as housekeeping and that it was the sort of money that would only be significant if an individual won it in a lotto. Very, very interesting sort of language around it. it um, it's 350 million, isn't it? <laughs> it's going to bring in. It's a, a big, quite a big lotto win by the uh, by New Zealand standards. I mean, I think clearly um, David Park is dancing on the the head of a pin there. It, it is a tax change. Yes, it was a tax change that officials recommended, and they had flagged that this would be possible. That if you increase the top tax rate, but you don't change the tax rate for trust, then of course people are going to maybe look at um, moving their money there. So, in that respect, I think he's being a bit cute. Um, I, I don't. I, th- I wonder if this is sort of testing the waters a little bit for further tax policy from Labour later on in the year on the campaign trail you know it's it's a pretty hard change to attack because most New Zealanders don't have trust and this idea that um, what was it five percent of the trusts or trustees have 78 percent of the money in them or it's a hugely disproportionate figure so um, it's that sort of rich prick argument that Michael Sir Michael Cullen used to you know put about and you know Grant Robertson had Sir Michael's tie on yesterday when he was delivering the budget so maybe he's channeling some of that but um, I was really interested we you know, with the news hub poll this week showed a majority in favor of a wealth tax um, whether they go that way I don't know but you could do that sort of 
neutral transfer where you put some form of wealth tax on and in return do something like scrap the bottom tax threshold. That's something I've heard floated a little bit in the past. Whether or not that's viable given the costs and the environment, I don't know, but it is it is interesting. I wonder if they're kind of softening the public up further for something more significant in the tax space. Is that argument that this is not a tax, a new tax because we've had it under consideration, what else have they got under consideration? Could they say that the wealth, um, those sort of taxes have been things they've been monitoring and considering? Because then they won't be doing the same thing. Uh, second question I have is, Sam or Joe, who, what is National's position on the trustee tax? Did they come out and say keep or, or, or throw? I think they've sort of shied away from it a little bit, Joe, is that right? Yeah, I, I don't think there was a um, very specific answer to it, actually. Um, obviously, they were quite uh, blunt about saying that they would uh, take back the um, scrapping of the prescription charges. Um, again, I think they have fudged a little bit on the ECE for two-year-olds. So, yeah, no... Yeah, no sort of strong answers on that. And that, that sort of shows how politically astute I think this budget is in some respects. And I was looking at the the main pages of the the Herald and stuff last night, our two largest news websites, and they had National vowing to bring back five dollar prescription fee if elected. And that is just a nightmare headline. Like if if you elect us as your government, we will make you pay more for your medication. So it, it's kind of clever in a sense. Uh, you know, you can have that debate of whether or not it's the best use of government revenue, best health policy. But it's it sort of put National in an awkward position in terms of lobbying to make New Zealanders pay more for something. And I think they've also ruled out keeping the half price transport, public transport, and free for under whatever the age was. Um, you know, again, that's a hard ask for National to start making that case. We're going to withdraw that. We're going to withdraw the prescription. Well, put on a prescription <laughs> fee again. Um, it's difficult politics to turn those over. I'm, I'm kind of interested too, having listened to um, both Christopher Luxon and Nicola Willis um, post-budget and the, the sort of various comments they've made about uh, you know what spending has occurred and how they would do things differently. And oh, I mean, I'm interested in, in maybe this one for you, Tim. You know, Nicola Willis is talking about sort of increasing um, the health spend, increasing the education spend, giving tax cuts, doing all the things that need to be do, um, done around infrastructure, um, housing, everything as a result of all the severe weather events we've had. And yes, I take the point that they want to see the sort of final, final numbers before putting together their alternative budget. Um, you could argue that ACT is maybe slightly smarter having decided to just go ahead with the numbers that are already there and will make adjustments um, closer to the election just so that they can actually say to the electorate, well, this is what you know we're offering at this point. But what do you think, Tim, in terms of where Nicola Willis is standing currently when she says, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but there's no costings around it and no clear sort of idea of where all of that money's actually going to come from? Well, Joe, I think she's sailing into that Bermuda Triangle that Labor keeps labelling Nationals' um, economic forecasts and policies. Sam and I were discussing it a bit earlier. She can't do it all, uh, and she can't just take us all on trust or get us to take her on trust. You can't cut taxes, increase spending, reduce debt. Um, I heard Chris Luxon at his pre-budget speech the other day at the Auckland Chamber uh, talking about uh, Nicola Willis and a team getting together after the election and line by line going through departmental and, and ministry spending. The kind of razor gang that Ruth Richardson brought in uh, 30 years ago, uh, similarly saying they needed to take you know, the, the economy by the scruff of the neck. But you do a lot of work with that kind of line by line um, departmental cost cutting, and it amounts to hundreds of millions. It doesn't amount to the billions, billions that you need to do to get out of your Bermuda Triangle. They really need to, they will need to look at something universal. Um, we've talked about universality, that Labor favours it, National needs to attack something and remove some spending. Uh, and that's going to be a juggle because that's usually you're removing the spending on people who don't need it, therefore are better off, therefore are more likely maybe to be more of a centre-right disposition. 
How do you think uh, this week has gone, Sam, in terms of the attacks from Labour toward Nicola Willis about her spending far too much time in business circles and the uh, suggestion that basically the Auckland business circles are saying, we're sick of Luxon and, and we want you, Nicola. It's, it's played out in the House quite a bit this week. Do you think that Nicola has, um, I guess, handled that well? I, I think so, relatively well. I mean, this is almost like we saw what we saw with Jacinda Ardern in, in the early part of 2017, right, when you had Andrew Little, who was languishing in terms of favourability, Labour not doing so well, and you had some people say, hey, Jacinda, why not se- step up? So it's deja vu all over again, just on the other side of the aisle. But, um, yeah, I, I think there's a different position in terms of National is, is in a much stronger position in the polls. They're very viable in terms of having a chance of forming the next government. Government. So, look, I think Nicola's very on on message and very disciplined. I don't I don't see her as sort of having done anything to enable this whispering. But it's just kind of natural when you have a leader who does seem to be relatively unpopular, still has issues around trust, around being seen as out of touch. So it's, it is dangerous and it's corrosive, right, if you have this whispering campaign, even if it's sort of very uniformal and, and unofficial and informal, um, it can kind of erode the, the confidence and the standing of your leader. Tim, what do you think? Joe, well, Joe, can I jump in a bit here? I, I think this is very likely to have played out like this. I wasn't at whatever the business function was at which this was raised with Nicola Willis about her being a better option than her leader. Uh, but this is what happens in these things. She goes to a small gathering of business or, or at least people from all sorts of work, walks of life. These aren't necessarily major figures in finance or business and, and it's not the business sector or you know business chamber necessarily. And someone in question time, uh, often someone who's full of their own views, uh, gets up and says, well, look, you'd be better. Why don't you ever go? Your guy's not doing any good. We think you'd be better. And there are murmurings of assent and various other people might pipe up. Nicola Willis will have given a very straight, um, very endorsing of Christopher's skills and leadership. And if you got to know him, you'd know that he's a good fella. Uh, One to one, they're all good. They always say about the leader. Uh, and that's where it goes from. And then someone who was there among what was apparently a small group goes out to their workplace, tells someone that gets back initially through filters up to the Herald and then on to uh, News Talk ZB. And all of a sudden we've got a, a campaign by business um, against Christopher Luxon. I, I think these are often nonsense. Um, a quick uh, thing to back up what Sam was saying about Jacinda Ardern and Andrew Little. The same thing could have been reported about a media club, the press club, meeting in 2017 in Hamilton, uh, at which Jacinda Ardern spoke as deputy, and various journalists got up quite confronting of her in the confidential section saying, why are you letting that man, that guy, uh, stand in your way? And you could have come out of that and said, journalists are campaigning for you know um, Jacinda to overturn Little. I think these things are a factor of kind of a informal suggestion, uh, a bit of whispering, a bit of murmuring, and then they get a bit of a flame. That's my view. Yeah, I mean, I did have um, conversations uh, after the budget. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, different people from different parts of the country that turn up um, for that lock-up and and had a few conversations and, and certainly got told of you know, what had happened in that business meeting, and it's very much as you describe it, um, Tim, and it was the last question um, of sort of an hour-long session. Uh, So it wasn't sort of some, you know, big sort of key discussion that took place. It was just almost like a throwaway question at the end. And and yes, um, I understand that people did sort of go, yeah, 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 like good question. But, you know, it wasn't the sort of topic of the day or anything. And and it's probably worth um, mentioning as well. You've talked about, you know, Jacinda Ardern and, and Andrew Little and that dynamic. I mean, you just look at any of the National Party leaders over the last wee while. I mean, there was story after story when Simon Bridges was leader of National MPs going out into their electorates to various um, you know, community meetings or um, being out at the local market stall and having every second person come up to them and say, when are you going to get rid of your leader? I mean, this, is, this always goes on. There's, you know, the, the rumblings happen. Sometimes it turns into a coup. Nationals had plenty of them. Um, and other times it doesn't. Well, well, it does sometimes, but this is not completely false, the concern within national or business about Christopher Luxon. 
uh, I was mentioning to Sam that I had heard from a very senior person in the party of National, surprisingly so, that there was undermining going on. And I said, surely not internally in the party, as well as externally, and they sort of nodded. That, and, and well, actually that person was going to go along to a meeting just to kind of get in, on top of this. Um, so there are people who want it to be better. Um, he's, isn't he lower now going into the election year than J Judith was going into election year? Um, and, you know, her result wasn't good. That They have fears, and at this point in the electoral cycle they get worried. And Joe, I think you were talking, we were talking about uh, Thomas Coughlin's piece following the new sub poll where he quoted a number of MPs anonymously and the fact that they're talking at all is pretty pretty striking and pretty staggering, right? You had that sort of very early discipline, they, they kind of tamped up the leaks when Luxon took over and that seems to have, have dissipated a bit as well, hasn't it? Oh, totally. And I mean, I said to Christopher Luxon this week, um, you know, when we had a stand up with him, you, what are you, what are you going to do about this? Are you going into your caucus meeting and telling your MPs to shut up because you've had this period where it's all been disciplined and everything's been going well, and whether you like it or not, these sorts of st stories, you know, and these sorts of rumblings create a narrative, and and you should be worried about that, shouldn't you? And and he sort of said, oh no, it's nothing. I'm I'm completely comfortable, which was exactly the same response he had to uh, News Hub when they put the poll results around the fact that you know more New Zealanders, well, almost a majority of um, those polled, thought that he was out of touch with the issues affecting New Zealanders. And his response was, I don't think I'm out of touch. I mean, saying you don't think you're out of touch and saying you don't think your MPs are talking about you doesn't make it true. And on that subject whether you're out of touch or not, explaining is losing. Today our newsroom audience question is, is Labour about to spring a surprise in Ikaroa Rāwhiti? Now for those of you who are on Sam Such Davis' favourite website, Twitter, you might have seen some talk about Tane Randall, the former All Black. I do gather that he is... In the mix, I think, is what we would call it uh, for Ikaroa Rāwhiti. I have had a couple of informal conversations with um, some Labour MPs about it. He certainly has been pretty active in Ikaroa Rāwhiti for about the last decade, I understand. He's quite involved in the community, um, iwi, sort of local organisations. Um, he is a bit political, so not a surprise um, for Labour that they are hearing him as someone who might be interested. I did ask uh, Willie Jackson about it, who's obviously the um, Labour Murray seat uh, campaign chair. He said that he had certainly heard about it, but he hadn't had a conversation with Tane Randall. Um, yeah, so there's, it's, it's definitely not not happening. Um, but I mean, the other problem that they actually have in that seat at the moment is that they don't have a Labour electoral committee yet because the current one is completely stacked with uh, Mika Whaiteri's whānau, which of course is not particularly useful when she has uh, defected to Te Party Māori. So the first thing Labour's got to sort out is getting an LEC sorted. And then, yeah, who knows, perhaps we are going to have former All Black Tane Randall running for Labour in that seat. Um, Tim, any thoughts on whether this is a good or a bad idea? Oh, all I'd say is that Tane Randall has come f and, uh, from a place where he was in an organisation in great trouble, the All Black team of that era. Um, so coming into Labour, he'll be in familiar territory perhaps. Uh, look, he's, a, I think, a fine guy. He always was a young, tipped for a captain when he was a very young guy. So he's obviously a guy of leadership. Uh, he was captain, I think, when we got bowled um, in 1999 out of the World Cup. Uh, we had the, a run of losses. He's, he's been through the mill. He may well have become, an, uh, through that, uh, a stronger character and a, a sort of a person of, of mana. As a Cantabrian, this is not really related to Ikaroa Rafati, but I feel like I should pitch for a seat for Todd Blackadder somewhere in the country. I don't know if we can move Duncan Webb out of Christchurch Central. Let's see what we can do. I think we've moved on from having um, former All Blacks involved in any sort of political and diplomatic roles. I think we covered that off nicely the other week. Can I just ask a subs subsidiary question, not from a reader, but from me to you two. This uh, presentation of the government in press releases in particular and in the budget documents, uh, selling itself as, quotes, the Chris Hipkins government is going to do A, the Chris Hipkins government is going to do B and C. What's behind that? Uh, Joe, is it, I hadn't seen it before and it seems very personalised to me. 
Well, I'm actually going to throw this to Sam because he is the resident hater of any sort of like political phrase. So I feel like this is a good one for you to answer, Sam. Uh, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. I don't know if I have an official thumbs up or thumbs down for the Chris Hipkins government yet. I'm going to have to chew it over and see how often we hear it in the coming weeks. I think it's striking on two fronts. One, it shows that they are actually willing to turn this into a bit of a presidential contest, you know, to make it a battle of popularity with Chris Luxon. They've seen that he's not doing well in the polls, and that's, you know, in terms of his personality um, performance and trust ratings. And that's quite interesting because, you know, Jacinda Ardern was this huge figure, and Chris Hipkins is, is not anywhere near that in terms of charisma, and yet he's still got a, a pretty clear march on, on Luxon on that front. And, and secondly, and I think you were saying this earlier, Tim, it, it's about, I think, making a bit of a clean break from the Ardern years and saying that, you know, this is a new government in a sense, even though it's not really. So that's the kind of framing, I think. So it'll be interesting to see if this is a line that they keep using in the um, the weeks ahead. Again, it might be a bit of a dry run to see how it's received by the public and, and how it tests. But it, yeah, it was fascinating. We could rebrand to the Joe Moyer podcast. I like it. <laughs> Does that involve any extra work? Because I'm not here for it. <laughs> No payment either. (laughs) Great, my favourite kind. Let's wrap things up with some recommendations. Something you've watched, read or listened to that you think others might enjoy as well. Sam. Uh, I am recommending Daniel McLaughlin's piece on the spin-off about the budget and the budget kludgeocracy, as he calls it. It's the apparently a phrase, clumsy but uh, typically effective solutions to particular problems. So this kind of awkward thing of, yeah, let's do a little thing here on prescriptions and a little thing here, something else, but not really having that sort of transformational or system-level change. So don't know whether I agree with it entirely or not, but it it was fascinating and I'd, I'd recommend reading it. And what about you, Tim? Well, mine is actually not a, a something to read or to view. It's the audio, or you can actually watch it on Parliament TV, of Te Pāori Māori le- co-leader uh, Rauri Waititi on the day of the Wellington uh, hostel fire tragedy, um, singing a waiata uh, in tribute. And it's stunning, poignant and a beautiful voice, and I recommend everyone just to go and take a few moments. It's calming and very dignified. Yeah, I was in the house that day, and it was absolutely beautiful, so um, highly endorse that recommendation as well. Um, In terms of mine, um, I am going to recommend the story Building Safety is Not a War on Landlords. It's from the Greens. Um, Forget about the fact that I wrote it, because that's not actually important here. The fact that it's on Newsroom is important. Um, I just think that it is worth uh, people going and having a look at the the language and the sort of concerns from Marama Davidson and James Shaw in the wake of that uh, tragic, tragic uh, fire at Loafers Lodge in Wellington here earlier this week. Um, It was interesting in the House when uh, a lot of the speeches uh, immediately in the aftermath were centred around, uh, you know, sending love and and prayers to those affected, which is 100% accurate, but not choosing to ask questions about what had happened. And the Green Party didn't take that approach. And I kind of expanded um, on the speech that James Shaw gave in the House earlier this week in a a conversation with both of the co-leaders, where they talked about the fact that this was a preventable tragedy and that, you know... excuses and delay tactics need to stop basically so some really interesting thoughts there you can check that one out on newsroom that's it from Raw Politics for this week thank you to our producers Hugo Stewart and Mark Jennings our readers, listeners and watchers please send me any burning questions you have for next week you can email me on joe.moya at newsroom.co.nz thank you Sam and Tim for your contributions as always cheers lovely to have you here great to be here You can find us next week, same time, same place, here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.